Please take your seats. We're about to start. Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. We're about to start. Thank you. Welcome back, everybody, and welcome to the Policy Dialogue Forum second plenary on innovation in teacher education. And this is the final working session of the day. Uh, my name is Hugh Delaney. Uh, I'm with UNICEF and I'll be your moderator for this session. I find myself here in the very unusual situation of being alone on stage, but the, the good news is we have a very high level and distinguished panel to keep us company uh, who are joining us remotely uh, for the next uh, 60 minutes, which is the dur duration of this session. Now, before I present the panel members, let me just run over some small housekeeping as usual. Um, unfortunately, there'll be no interpretation uh, during this session. There's a slight technical problem, which may be fixed as the session goes on, but at the beginning of the session, at least, there won't be interpretation um, through different languages. Uh, those participants joining us online are encouraged to um, mute, um, but of course we want them to participate. And we encourage online participants, the audience, to use the chat function and to ask questions or make comments, which will be passed to me during the session and I can um, read them out if there are questions for the panel members. Panelists themselves are, are, are encouraged to keep their cameras on, but of course they can mute if they're not uh, speaking. Yeah. Okay, and we have an announcement also in French uh, as there's no interpretation, please. Oui, avec toutes nos excuses, malheureusement, on a un problème avec l'interprétation en français. On, on s'excuse vraiment. On va essayer de faire en sorte que ça puisse marcher pendant la séance. Mais toutes nos excuses, malheureusement, pour l'instant, ça ne peut pas marcher. Voilà, désolé. Euh, mais j'espère que vous pouvez suivre quand même. Merci. Pour les questions-réponses, je serai contente d'interpréter si vous voulez poser des questions en français. Il n'y aura pas de problème. Merci beaucoup. I'm glad I have you here. I, I, I don't think I would have managed a, a bilingual moderation, but um, it's so stay close, please don't go too far. I'm, I may need you at some point in, in the session. Um, let's, let's move on now to uh, introduce and to welcome the speakers. And we have a very high level and wonderful panel with us today uh, from different um, disciplines, uh, the first speaker um, is the Minister for Education from Colombia, Her Excellency Maria Victoria Angulo. You're very welcome to this panel and you're joining us remotely. Uh, the second speaker is the Honourable Minister of Education from Estonia, Her Excellency Ms. Lina Kirstner, and you're also welcome to the panel. Thank you very much uh, for joining us. Um, I'll introduce all the speakers first and then I'll pose questions to specific speakers. Also joining us today uh, on the panel is Mr. Gerald Letendre, who's the Professor of Education and International Affairs from Pennsylvania State University. You're welcome. Thanks for joining us. We also have uh, Professor Zhang from the Shanghai Normal University, who will be also speaking uh, on, the on, on this session. And um, the final speaker uh, also is Ms. Christine Safwat, who is the Executive Director of Education Me Foundation. So please, can we give a round of applause for our speakers? Let me, let me also set the scene uh, with a few words for this session. Um, and I want to just situate the discussion we're going to have in the context of the overall policy dialogue, but also in the, in the situation we found ourselves with COVID-19 over the last 18 months. Um, as with any innovation, which is the theme of this policy dialogue, new models and practices in teacher education are driven by the need to better respond to changing circumstances and evolving needs. More than 18 months after the initial shock to education systems, but also teacher education and training systems, teacher educators and policymakers are taking stock of lessons learned, mapping out areas of improvement, and engaging in action to ensure that recovery addresses all teachers' current and anticipated needs. Initial reporting indicates greater use of online and hybrid programs 
to develop teachers' confidence in digital pedagogies, remote teaching, and enable more flexible learning. The pandemic has also revealed a need to rethink the teacher education curriculum to include areas previously given inadequate attention, ICT in education, education for sustainable development, implementing remedial education programs, and also not forgetting uh, climate change. This panel today uh, aims to contribute towards innovative approaches towards teacher education from a variety of perspectives and through a dialogue between experts from national ministries, academia, teacher training institutions and educators themselves. Let's move on because we've given, we've given the panelists a very tough task. We've allocated five minutes for each because we have one hour and we want to allow for question and answers and interaction. And so I'm going to ask Her Excellency Maria Vittoria Angulo, the Minister of Education from Colombia, uh, the first question. Um, Your Excellency, are you, are you online? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, of course. Wonderful. Now, let me ask you a question, if I may. Um, COVID-19 brought with it new needs for teacher training. What are the most important innovations that emerged in your context uh, to ensure teacher training needs were met, including an equity perspective to include teachers in remote regions? I want to thank UNESCO and the International Teacher Task Force for Education 23 for inviting me to participate in this forum and be able to share the experience and the innovation we have been able to implement in Colombia regarding teacher training and mention some of the new challenges we are facing after pandemic. In Colombia, based on our national development plan, Pact for Colombia, Pact Pac for Equity, we have drawn some premises about teacher training. We have been key elements even before the pandemic arrived. The first one, strengthening school management leadership that improve student learning, reduce the teacher training quality gap between the rural and the urban sector, strengthen pedagogical and didactic practice so that the teacher learning process become more pertinent, significant, and effective in the educational process. Incentivize location-based training process, recognizing schools and learning communities that offer opportunities to promote reflection and improve pedagogical practices. We know that to achieve quality education, the professional development of teacher is key, given their central role in education system. In Colombia, just like in many other regions of the world, we currently have big challenges, so it's motivating teachers to access training programs that will allow them to be prepared to teach students to be responsible 21st century citizens and school realities. Digital transformation is a reality and we must adapt our system and create incentives for teachers to learn and innovate. The situation created by COVID-19 has had a significant impact in education sector, especially in the institutional dynamics on educators, students, and the community in general. This has challenged us to achieve continuity in educational process and work recover learning. So with the purpose of achieving continuity in education, the Ministry of Education designed a professional development strategy for teachers to provide them with tools and strengthen the professional competences, create transformations and innovate in their teacher practice, incorporating methodologies that are supported by virtual resource and have more resource to design school activities mediated by technology. The Ministry of Education also accelerated the transformation of the web portal Colombia Aprende and turned it into an ecosystem that allowed teachers and other education community members to access tools, digital educational content, pedagogical materials, learning paths, and collaborative works environment to support the work in favor of the students' learning process. We also developed the program Zero Rating in close collaboration between national government and telecommunication companies. 
So education communities through the country could have free access to mobile portal Colombia Aprende. This was particularly relevant for the country rural areas. We work in the initial teacher training by strengthening education programs and giving accompaniment to the teacher training colleges. In continual professional development, we saw to develop teachers' ability to strengthen curricula by offering programs, courses in different fields of study. We developed a web platform called Contacto Maestro, so teachers and school management have free tools available to allow them to continue their professional development process, centered in transforming, taking care, connecting and inspire. Additionally, we have put digital resource and materials to develop the learning process and help strengthen their pedagogical practice. We also create other programs, leadership school for rectors and school management staff as a professional and personal development system, seeking to transform leader, uh, leadership practice of rectors, rural directors and coordinators to improve school management and contribute to the integral development and learning students. With the leadership school, we seek to strengthen the personal pedagogical and administrative management on five components, training, well-being and personal development, network and learning communities, research and resource bank. Our leadership school has an evaluation system with the goal of promoting constant improvement. The production of timely information allow us to work to improve and adapting the leadership practices as an input for decision making based in evidence and identification and management of required adjustment. This school has empowered school management personnel to direct their schools from a pedagogical leadership perspective based on trust. For educators and education community in general, it has helped to create process for more flexible curricula and to return to face-to-face -face education. The National Ministry of Education also accelerated the transformation of the web portal Colombia Aprendi and turned into ecosystem that allow teachers and other education community members to access tools, digital education content, pedagogical materials, learning paths, and collaborative work environments to support their work in favor to student learning process. In conclusion, to achieve a return to face-to-face -to -face and impact on learning process, it's vital to design and implement programs and projects that accompany teachers and principal working on socio-emotional skills and impacting on didactic practice. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Honorable Minister, and for those inspiring words and for outlining really the determined efforts that came across in, in, in five minutes of intervention which really focus on empowering school leaders and school communities and teachers, including using innovative approaches which are equity focused. I'm sure there'll be some questions if we can have time in the Q&A to uh, delve deeper, but thank you, thank you again, uh, Honorable Minister. Uh, that was a wonderful um, intervention. Let's move on to the next uh, panel member, um, the Honorable Minister for Education from Estonia. Um, Her Excellency Lina Kirstner, and in Estonia is a country we hear more and more about from a very positive perspective when it comes to education. And this question um, is uh, again looking at uh, innovation. And, and the question is, Honourable Minister, with the growth of digital technology and artificial intelligence, how do teacher education and training oh, systems need to change to foster teacher agency and autonomy and avoid constraining teachers' creativity, professionalism, and pedagogical judgment. And, and Honourable Minister, before you come in, apology, I have to announce that the interpretation is back working again. Uh, thank you very much to the technicians who worked on that. Um, Honourable Minister, Her Excellency Lena Kirstner, uh, over to you to respond to this question, please. Ladies and gentlemen, Honourable panelists, Dear audience, thank you for the opportunity to join this high-level panel. As we stand before new challenges that reach much beyond COVID-19, we must learn to adapt. 
better yet, we must stay two steps ahead of these uh, fast-paced developments. I believe that the best way to prepare our societies for these changes is through innovation of the teaching profession. Teachers are much more than school personnel interacting with our, with our children on a day-to-day -day basis. They are the educators of our edu societies, facing the tough responsibility of preparing generation for the future. Innovative approaches in the teaching profession are a topic I care about deeply. How can teachers' professional development encourage agency and autonomy without hindering educator, educators' creativity and professionalism? How to do it all in a context of rapidly changing technological, technological developments, such as digital technologies? Or let me rephrase this question. How do we offer our best support to teachers in the context of increasingly higher expectation for the society and increasingly faster changes? We like to think of how we prepare our children for the future through curricula, but how do we prepare our teachers for the future? I will use this opportunity to reflect on the vision for teacher education innovation based on Estonian experience. A first tool for, for the renewal of teacher education is through learning content, content and professional development. Expectations and demands for the context of teacher education should not just come top down from policymakers. Institutions providing uh, teacher education, in Estonia example, universities, should be just as included in the dialogue of shaping how teachers are educated. Where teachers are trained by universities, we can ensure that core of the teacher profession is shaped by meticulous research and the best available knowledge. Secondly, I would like to stress the importance of the teacher's agency, teacher autonomy and personalized learning pathways for teachers. Estonian curricula for basic and upper secondary schools set the learning outcomes for graduation. National curricula do not define how these outcomes should be met. This means that teachers and schools are independent in how they attain these goals. They choose the learning materials they use, in, in what uh, order they go through the curricula and so on. This is an important tool for supporting the teacher's autonomy and agency. However, such autonomy does not mean that the teacher should be unsupported. Independence should not equal with solitude or isolation. Thus, an individual approach for the teacher, for the school network, together with in-service training throughout the teacher's career, is one of the tools which could help provide tailored support for teachers. This brings me to my third point. Every school is unique by its student and teacher body, its size, its regional context and position, and so on. This means that the needs of every school is ensuring their development are just as unique. Estonia has implemented intervention development programs tailored for schools to support, among others, teachers in their development according to their needs, strengths and weaknesses. A wide selection of tools is available for supporting teachers throughout their career. In addition to traditional in-service training for self-assessment and analysis of competences, a 360-degree feedback method for the teachers uh, is offered, together with resources for interpreting, in interpreting and making use of this feedback. Another great example includes the competence, uh, competence centers that are established at the universities. They offer support for schools 
and help with making use of the latest evidence-based pedagogical knowledge and approach. Schools can also apply for funds for professional development. Finally, as we come to technolo technological developments, it is important that we make use of the available digital tools, tools for enhancing the learning process. For the past three decades, Estonia has built its digital infrastructure aiming at reaching a high level of digital literacy across society. Naturally, technological improvements are ongoing and our work is far from over. The COVID-19 crisis did show that our schools were ready to move from contact learning to digital sphere. However, it is also showed our weaknesses and how the crisis served as a catalyst for development. Digital competences and digital technologies are a crucial tool in Estonia school. However, we must not think of them as a separate goal. We see emerging technologies and educational innovation tools as an opportunity to diversify and personalize teaching and learning. We must assure that the solutions we create take wasted time out of learning and teaching. I hope these ideas will contribute of the discussion and I look forward to hearing your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honourable Minister, for such rich and instructive contribution. Definitely it contributed to our understanding and quite a lot to unpack, but I think we understand uh, how the Estonian education system does stay one or two steps ahead through its adaptability, which I think was the key theme that came out of the uh, intervention there. But the great responsibility that teachers hold um, and also the system has responsibility for supporting teachers who remain themselves quite autonomous, it seems, um, and each school being very unique in that regard. So I think there's quite a lot of, of rich um, uh, material in that contribution. And, and thank you once again. We may, we may come back uh, later on some of the themes. Uh, let us move on uh, to our third um, speaker on the panelist uh, today, Mr. Gerald Letendre, who's professor of Education and International Affairs in Pennsylvania State University. Uh, the question which I want to pose uh, to you, uh, Professor, is how does teacher education curriculum, uh, forms of learning and learning environments need to be rethought to enable teachers to continuously develop the competencies needed to adapt to changing contexts and student needs? Professor, over, over to you to take that particular question. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. And hello to my fellow panelists and to all participants online in Kigali. Uh, I'm going to share in the chat uh, a link uh, to some ideas in the form of a PowerPoint if you want to uh, delve further into some of the ideas I'm going to talk about. The question I was asked to address poses the problem as a holistic one. Uh, we know that pedagogical content knowledge, knowledge of the subject is a necessary condition for good teaching, but it isn't sufficient. Effective teachers go beyond mastery of the subject curriculum and focus deeply on the learning environment in their classroom. They develop the skill sets needed to be constantly reflecting on their practice and its impact on individual students and student interactions. This, of course, is very difficult to do. It can take years to master these skills. But if we integrate a focus on inquiry from the start in teacher education, we can prepare new teachers to engage in self-directed lifelong professional learning. And this is what I will argue is what we, needs to be rethought in terms of how we enable teachers to continuously develop the competencies that we need. So when I say a focus on inquiry to prepare teachers for lifelong professional learning, what is inquiry? It means the ability to identify, reflect on, and solve problems that arise in one's classroom. It assumes that student teachers can learn to be critical consumers of theory or practical advice and generate their own professional knowledge. 
Typically, learning this uh, process also inver involves working with both peers and mentors to identify problems. As we've heard before, it's not to be done in isolation. Uh, groups need to generate ideas for solutions and identify ways to assess if the solution is working. An inquiry also emphasizes applying theory to actual classroom problems and assessing if the theory itself is appropriate. So strong inquiry skills allow teachers to study their own classroom and create inclusive and equitable practices in the classroom. As I said, developing strong inquiry skills appears to take some time to develop. So policymakers have to think about more than reforms that just promote inquiry in teacher education. They must also consider how teacher-focused policies on working conditions or professional development will continue to support inquiry as part of the expected work routines the teachers engage in. Now, we know that nations around the world have already focused heavily on teacher education. Uh, I've done a study of Nordic and East Asian countries, eight nations overall. We identified uh, teacher-focused policies that were pa passed in the last 20 years, and there were 56 of them, 22 of which were focused on teacher education. 23 were on professional development. Um, and this is excellent. Uh, it's good to see nations involving in this. But one problem we found is that nations rarely coordinated these reforms or had a sustained vision of high quality teaching uh, during this 20 year period. And so when we think about policy attempts to you know, reform teacher education, while nations often pick teacher education, um, they rarely consider how this might be impacted by other aspects of teacher education policy. There are often problems with entrenched institutional arrangements uh, and integrating teacher education with later teacher professional development is quite important. As the Teacher Policy Development Guide from the International Tax Force and Teachers for Education said, most education sector plans create more fragmentation and less coherence. They address teacher policy dimensions only partially. So if you think about this, what has to happen is thinking about where teacher education policy comes in the entire spectrum of what a nation is doing. And in our book, Improving Teacher Quality, the U.S. Teaching Workforce in a Global Context, Motoko Akiba and I show that when nations have a clear vision for high quality teachers and systematically coordinate educational policy reforms, these coherent policies tend to reinforce each other. So let me now offer some examples of what I think are some interesting practices. Uh, one, in terms of an integration of vision can be seen in Singapore's Thinking Schools Learning Nations reforms, which began in 1997 and included subsequent reforms like Teach Less, Learn More that emphasize teacher inquiry and reflection on the curriculum and teachers' own instructional practice. And you can easily identify that online. Two others I'd like to talk about are one, first, lesson study. Uh, you can access the Worldwide Lesson Study uh, Association's uh, page to look more there. Lesson study, of course, originated in Japan as a teacher-initiated form of professional learning, but it's been adopted around the world. What I wanna focus on mostly though for this presentation is a collaboration between ISTEP, the Stanford Teacher Education Program, and teacher educators in Brazil. Uh, and this is the PED Brazil program. It's at pedbr.org. This program involves 195 faculty members in 15 different higher education institutions. The curriculum consists of eight sequential models, including professional content development, but also inquiry. It uses mentors who alongside university-based faculty support teachers in their own classrooms and uses professional learning experiences based on real examples of student work. This recenters teacher education on what is to be the object, I believe, the true object of teacher professional learning, which is how to adapt the curriculum to the social conditions of the classroom. Uh, in this collaborative network, uh, teachers are asked to choose a student they'd like to know more about, to interview the family, and to look at details of student relationships in the classroom as part of their training on learning how to do inquiry that really identifies where the teacher can improve her capacity to understand the student holistically. As I said, uh, I've created a link there if you want to look up some more of those specific sites. It's been a pleasure to be a part of this uh, symposium. Thank you very much.
No, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. I think it's been a very illuminating uh, intervention. Um, and you identify the thinking school approach in Singapore, the teach less, learn more. I, I, um, I, I, I'm familiar with that. I think even in this short intervention, we learned quite a lot, I, I understand, in terms of the key to lifelong professional uh, learning for teachers and the, and the key element of focusing on inquiry. So thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, intervention and also the links which can be accessed, which Professor has uh, put into the chat which are worth ch checking out and having a look through. Let's move on. Um, we have two more speakers in this session and hopefully we'll have some time for questions also. Uh, the next speaker, uh, Professor Zhang from the Shanghai Normal University um, was oh. having some technical difficulties, but hopefully is online with us now. Um, yes, I'm, I'm online. Wonderful. And let me ask the question, um, how can systems of continuing professional development be strengthened to ensure teachers remain innovative in their approach to teaching? And what do teacher trainers require to help meet this challenge? Over to you, Professor okay. Zhang. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Chairman. And also the people, uh, UNESCO gave me the chance to introduce something happening in Shanghai. So I, I, I would just try to have the PPT on that. So PowerPoint. So can see uh, maybe my English is not so good and then we can uh, share that. So uh, Shanghai is a very small city, but uh, with a very large population. And we also have uh, maybe six, uh, 160,000 teachers. So it is very important. And uh, we always in the uh, Pisa and the Tetis in the very top one. And so many countries uh, come to visit Shanghai. And we then try to answer how to do that. Uh, in my experiences, I think try to establish a triangle system for teachers' professional development is most important. The triangle system is organized by career letters and also evaluation and rewards. If all the teachers want to improve their evaluation, improve their uh, competences, they will be have the chance to the in service training. So this is the organization, uh, the competences, so uh, and uh, the, the system. And this system should made meet the motivation for the teacher's personal needs. So all people not only to be survived, but also want to realize their values. So this is the most important in the heart. And then also the teachers or the government shall not only do something for the teachers, but also try to together with the teachers union and the schools and other stakeholders to organize those kind of systems. So this system is organized by the three. So let's see the in Shanghai, the career letters. In this way, we have the junior, middle, senior levels. And also we now have the professorship of great teachers. If the teachers not only teach well, but also they can give the knowledges, how to teach, how to research, how to realize the students' needs. So in Shanghai now have more than 200 professorship teachers. So they can go. Not only that, we found the teachers, ordinary teachers are a little bit different from the school teacher, school principals. So we have both letters for only teachers, but also for the school principals. Then in their life, they can have developed step by step, all right, in their whole life, whole career. And if for that, we should have, of course, the performance, performance evaluation. We have the part two, two parts. One is the regular evaluation, the variation for registration, the variation for annual review and for promotion. And also not only for individuals, let the teachers to have their community. So let them to have a collective evaluation for what we call the teachers research groups, the schools. And on the other hand, we also have a various chances for teachers to show their, show their competencies, show their skills, show their attitudes. So we have a lot of games, shows, exhibitions, contests. And after that, they have the rewards. 
they from the school level, local, municipal, and national, for individuals and teaching groups, schools, and a lot of aspects for young teachers, middle school teachers, and also senior teachers for teaching project-based lesson designs, homework ICT skills. So various ways to encourage all people to show their capabilities, skills. And then if they want to do well, so we give the chance for all the teachers, all the teachers have the rights to be the join the in-service training. So we have the time arrangement every week all the teachers have half a working day and a plus a weekend a day. So they have the financial support. All the school-based training are paid by the schools. For the teacher's high degree, the teachers, they themselves are pay first. When they have the degrees and the certificates, they can return, get a return from the schools. And then most of the programs are paid by the government. So in this way, they have the time and a high financial support and they joined all kinds of the training from schools, from the university, teachers college for curriculum, uh, piecemeal identity association, ICT is very important. And now more and more people can choose what they want online. And for high level teachers, they not only should join that, but also to give the chance to train the young teachers. And in recent years, we have the, a lot of arrangement training now, changing to self-driven self learning, researching, and developing the materials by teachers. So this is a part of the research inquiry. After their research, they can produce some materials for training, for teaching, for bettering the students. Right. So in this way, the school-based training are very important. Not only we have the mentors for young teachers, we have the, all the teachers are organizing teaching research groups. Now, a lot of UK schools, they try to learn from that. And also we have the grade groups for, the, for all the teachers in the same grade, although they teach the different subjects, they can organize that. And just now the gentleman professor said that, we have the classroom observation. Now we have the lesson studies. Not only that, now we have the video studies. So all teachers can record what they teach, their behavior and change by themselves, improve them. Now more and more teachers join the research projects and the research groups. Not only that for evaluation, now we have a more than 250, we call the professional development schools not only for the young teachers, all teachers can improve in those kind of bases. So I think this is the Chinese, uh, Chinese way or Shanghai ways in the last few years. Thank you. All right. So now we have the center we called the UNESCO Teacher Education Center. And in the future, if all the people like, some people like to connect it with us, we ready, happy to do the cooperation with all the people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Zhang. Thank you so much. And I think we are all aware of the very high performance of the Shanghai uh, school system. And sometimes you forget that it actually, there's 24 million people in Shanghai we saw there on the Yeah, slide. 24, 24 yeah. million people plus uh, three, hundred, uh, 3 million floating people. Yeah, in floating. Or 27 million. <laughs> well, I, and, uh, so 24 million, that's already twice the population of Rwanda. So it puts it into perspective also. And I think you outlined very well there the focus on the career development ladder for teachers yeah. and the investments in uh, continuous professional development and providing agency to teachers themselves in terms of their own uh, professional development. So thank you very much. I'm sure there'll be uh, interest uh, if we have time during the questions to come back, but let us, in the interest of time, move on to our final speaker uh, on the panel. Uh, I have the pleasure to introduce uh, Ms. Christine Safwat uh, from Education Me Foundation. And the question which uh, we have um, developed um, for this segment is, what conditions or environments 
are conducive to sustained teacher participation in emergent communities of practice, both in virtual and real spaces? And what is the role of school leadership in supporting this? Over to you, um, Christine. Thank you very much for that. And it's a pleasure and honor to be in this esteemed panel. I'm humbled to be there. Um, uh, well, post COVID actually education sector specifically was mo one of the most sectors that was hit badly and teachers were left uh, in a way, if I may say helpless because the education system has uh, drastically changed and a lot of change and flexibility and agility was required. And I think, and I would say that that still is the case because there are, it's still very unstable and we still haven't figured out the best balance and the best way to move forward post COVID. Uh, and in a system as large as Egypt, um, of course, maybe not as large as China, but uh, we have a system with 20 million students, more than 1 million teachers and more than 55,000 public schools. Uh, most of them in areas where there's very limited access to technology and uh, also um, teachers lack a lot of the competencies which were required post COVID. Uh, so what we believe uh, was most essential is um, first of all, remembering that the teacher is a human being before, be before being a teacher and addressing teachers as human beings, taking a humanistic approach. Um, working on the mindset, uh, not just the competencies or the skills, but working on the mindset before changing the attitude. And so we focused a lot on, um, on giving them respect, giving them dignity, working on their mindset, why, why change needs to happen and what change would actually offer them. Working on, uh, we have a program that's called School Transformation Journey, which we work on building the capacities of the school team to transform public schools to become lifelong learning hubs. And in that, we work on the mindset of the school team in order to be able to shift their mindset to becoming a lifelong learning uh, educator or teacher. Because uh, as um, uh, 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 some of the panelists have mentioned, it, the, the education is, is continuously changing. And so what we are learning and teaching now might not be relevant tomorrow. And so what is more important is preparing teachers to become lifelong learners themselves so that they do not wait for a training or a professional development program to be able to advance their, them in their careers and in their jobs, but so that they are able themselves to grow themselves, to grow their skills, to work on their uh, own knowledge, skills, and values and so on. We've seen tremendous um, changes on ground. Uh, we've seen school leaders transform. Um, I just came back from a school visit in Upper Egypt in, in a very poor village in a governorate called Suhad. And the school is called Naga Tarakhan. And I would like to leave you with this uh, visit. Um, we started off with this school one and a half years ago. And the school team was extremely, extremely resistant. They didn't know why they should be attending those uh, sessions, what would co come out of it. They thought it's a training like any other training where they will just get uh, more knowledge, more content, but then uh, no application and no applicability. And they didn't, they really didn't want to attend. I was uh, fortunate that I actually attended their specific training of this specific school two years ago. And, um, and I visited the school last week and, I was uh, extremely uh, in, in impression and awe because I entered the school and you'd usually find in public schools, kids who are usually a bit, um, they're usually not, uh, not expressive. They're usually, um, they wouldn't want to talk. Teachers would be very cautious. School leaders would be a bit firm because of the, the so many challenges that they are facing on, on a daily basis. But what we saw in the school is a real transformation, starting from the school leader being very empowering, very encouraging, um, giving credit to the team, up to the school counselors, which is usually a role that is uh, on paper, but never activated in five public schools. We've seen them take not just the initiatives that we have introduced to them, but they've actually started doing a lot of initiatives across the school on school values, 
um, uh, uh, on uh, gender equality and so many uh, topics that you would never uh, imagine that they would actually address such topics in a very uh, closed uh, environment like in Upper Egypt. We've also seen teachers transform, uh, we visited classes really working uh, inside the classroom with acti activity-based uh, learning, uh, play-based learning. Um, we were astonished by the amount of change and transformation that happened inside the school. We've seen teachers whom have never used technology, whom now have YouTube channels of their own where they teach across. We've seen teachers who have WhatsApp groups with their students to use it in order to be able to continue the learning with the kids at home. We've seen the school that the kids themselves, sixth graders, they've done their own group so that they could study together over WhatsApp and they put the teacher on the group so that they could ask her questions. I'm talking about an extremely challenging context and a school that is an extremely poor area with extremely limited resources and also uh, very limited skills, but we found out that when we work on the mindset and when we really genuinely care to offer real support, to offer practical support, to tackle not just the professional uh, aspect and skills, but also the personal needs uh, of the school team, starting from the school leader or the school principal, all the way to the educators, the admins and the school counselors, real change can exist and can happen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that intervention. I picked up a wonderful phrase you, you said. You said, the teacher is a human being. <laughs> it's easy to forget sometimes. And you focused on the dignity and respect uh, uh, accorded to teachers. I don't know about you, but this October, when we celebrated International Teachers Day, I could see a change in terms of the respect that people have for teachers because of the uh, role that they've played during COVID-19 in supporting continued education and indeed supporting safe school reopening. I think that uh, there's also been a mindset change towards teachers as much as what is being talked about here. And I think it's very important points that came out in that um, presentation. So thank you, thank you very much. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to open the floor. First of all, we'll, we'll take one or two uh, questions from the floor if there are. And we also have some questions coming in on the chat, which I can refer to as necessary. So please, if you have somebody specific on the panel you would like to address your question to, please mention them. Uh, otherwise, we can uh, ask for volunteers from the panel. I have two hands here, one here and one at the back. There's a microphone uh, going around. I think it's at the back, so we can take the gentleman at the back and then we will take uh, you, Leon, at the front in a moment. Thank you. Uh, thank you, the moderator. I am Professor Abderazak Uniye of the University of Chigani. My question is to the Honorable Minister of uh, Colombia, where she talks about issue of uh, not Autonomy not meaning isolation or solitude. We have a situation where the curriculum, the assessment format, and every other thing are predetermined for the teacher. In the face of innovation, we are talking about teachers' autonomy. Are we sure teachers have that autonomy to decide mode of assessment? curricula offering different from what the policy makers have actually put in place. Because this is very key. We are in pandemic era, first wave, second wave, and now we have this Omicron. So can they actually deviate from Thank you. We'll move the. We have another microphone here. We'll take the two questions together. I think. Thank you. Um, thank you, moderator, for the flow. Um, 
uh, allow me to ask question in French. Um, I'm uh, Leon Mujenzi, the head of teacher development management uh, department at the Rwanda Basic Education Board. Uh, merci beaucoup à tous les panelists de nous avoir inspiré par rapport uh, à ce que vous faites dans vos pays respectifs. Ma question va tout droit au professeur Gérard Rétendre, professeur d'éducation et de relations internationales. Uh, je vous ai suivi avec beaucoup d'intérêt uh, lorsque vous parliez des différentes approches de formation des enseignants. Uh, dans mes responsabilités, je suis chargé justement de la formation des enseignants, mais c'est un grand défi auquel nous faisons face dans notre système éducatif rwandais, uh, avec plus de 85 000 uh, enseignants et dans, de l'école maternelle jusqu'à l'école secondaire. Alors, ma question est la suivante. Quel est le modèle le, le, de formation continue uh, d'enseignants, donc la, le plus efficace euh, que nous pouvons vraiment à, à avoir dans nos systèmes euh, et, et quel est euh, le temps à, approprié, le temps propice pour cette formation d'enseignants continue. Merci beaucoup. Thank you so much. So I think the first question did have, was directed at the Honorable Minister of Education from Colombia, who I hear may not be still on the line, And so I think that question is open to other panel members as well who may want to come in. And I think by the very nature of the question, it may be a suitable one for the Honorable Minister of Education from Estonia because of the, the, the theme of the question about autonomy uh, versus isolation and whether teachers have the power. The second question, Leon, thank you so much. You, you have directed your question as well in French, which I, I did understand actually. And I, I, I hope that uh, Mr. Gérald Letendre, I'm going by his name, I think he understood it, but he had the, the translation. But if the Honorable Minister for Education of Estonia would like to come in on the first question, please, if you're, if you're, if you're available thank to do so. You. Yes, thank you. Of course, uh, the teachers' autonomy are a very important issue. And uh, in Estonia, as I said uh, in my speech also, in Estonia, our teachers can um, um, uh, choose the methodology, how they uh, teach, and uh, all the teaching material also. And I think that uh, this is very important um, uh, issue about uh, education system. Thank you. Thank you so much. Professor Gerald Letendre, the question aimed at you is about the most effective approach to continuous professional development for teachers in the Rwanda context that our colleague from Rwanda Basic Education Board asked, and also the appropriate duration of training. Can you, can you shed some light perhaps on that from your experience, please, Professor? Uh, yes, and thank you for translating. Uh, despite my last name, my French is quite poor. Um, So I think here is where we really have to think about national conditions. Uh, so when you have a, a system where, um, you know, teachers may not have had extensive access to uh, mentoring in their uh, teacher training and where you have very strict curriculum and assessment standards, then inquiry is going to be a less effective mode for these teachers unless they get support from a central office or from some kind of uh, group that can help them to really target how their inquiry can meet those very specific assessments and those very rigid guidelines. It also suggests though that the ministry or um, other policymakers might want to review and revise how those you know, strict assessments are set in place, if I'm understanding this correctly, and to think about the more appropriate timing at what stage uh, we would want or like to see teachers beginning to be more uh, interactive and trying to take more autonomy over their own lesson development. Thank you very much. I have also some questions from the chat. I think we should give ample time to people who are also joining us remotely to have the opportunity to pose a question. Um, the first question I have is from a gentleman, Atef Ahmed, who has asked um, the question, how do you see the importance of teaching critical thinking and problem solving skills in pre-service training for teachers? And how far the, can these skills contribute 
to preparing innovative teachers? And that question uh, was posed to Professor Zhang, but others can come in also um, if they feel they can respond to that. But okay. Professor Zhang, would you, would you like to attempt a response to this question? All right, all right. Thank you for your chance and also the questions. I think it is very good. I think in the future, uh, in, in, in the past, usually when the teachers have the pre-service training, we said they should solve the two problems. So one is what to teach in the future, in their career. The other is how to teach. But I think in the nowadays, we should put how to do the research because we face a lot of new challenges. We cannot rely on the existing uh, knowledge from other countries or say from other situations because we face such students are different. So in the pre-service training, I mean, so for the teacher education, they should, I mean, the universities and also the, uh, uh, the teacher training institutes should put the critical thinking, the research problem solving in it. For example, I also, or I always ask the Shanghai teachers, what you have learned? They, they tell me, oh, I'm a language teacher. So I'm a physics educator teachers. I'm a, um, a chemistry teachers. I think I, I said to them, I asked them, I challenged them. I said, now all the people asked us to teach the students to learn how to learn and how to solve the problems. But uh, whether you can tell me how to solve the problems, if we face the problem, whether they have a different, I mean, a stages, what do you think first? And then the second, then the third. So we can see it is a process. First, you should make sure what kind of challenges or, or problems you face. It is the clearance of the problems. And then if you consider the problem is very clear, then you should make the plane to solve the problem. In the, in the plane, maybe you should see the tools, the procedures, the, pre -con the conditions, and the people you can work it together. Then into the doing, into the process of the making or solving. In, the prob in this kind of pr process, not only you said, oh, I just want to do, and after my finish, accomplish, we solve the problem. In fact, you should monitor the process then you will have the results. So this is a process. So are those kind of things, if the teachers never learned, how can they teach the students? We can not only have the dream in my mind, we teach the students and then the students can learn. So we, I think the critical thinking, the cre uh, creation, innovation, and the problem solving, those kind of knowledges and skills, even the attitudes about process, the process knowledge, the process skills, the process, uh, the, 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 the attitudes should be included in the pre-service training, pre-service education. So in China, in Shanghai, we just in this process, uh, we together do something, do some research with the OECD, we found, it is very useful. So in, uh, the, uh, in the year 2012, we will try to analyze the problem solving process, then to, uh, to reveal or unlock the process to the teachers. When the teachers learn that and they try that, then they can teach the students and facilitate it and help the students. Right, thank you. I try to answer in this way, right? It is my personal experiences, in fact, right? They're not, maybe not suitable to all the situation yeah, we can discuss, but anyhow, it is really very important. Thank you. And your perspective is very much valued. And thank you for that uh, response. Um, we're reaching the end of the session, but I do want to give the opportunity for maybe one last burning question, if we have anybody in the room who, who had a question and didn't have the opportunity, but really wants to pose it. We can, we can give time for one more 
uh, before we before we thank the, the panel members. Do we have any do we have any hands in the room? Um, we do, please, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the panel. Uh, it is a question slash reflection on, on what we have heard today. Uh, we've heard from, from the minister of, of Finland earlier this morning that there's no inspection, uh, for example, no inspectorate of, of education in, uh, in Finland. We've heard about the forms of evaluation in Shanghai, and we've heard in Estonia also that there's 360 degree feedback. So my question is, if we think about finding a balance between autonomy and between accountability, possibly the forms of feedback that are collective, that comes from, fee from peers, can help identify some of the needs for professional development. So my question would be, possibly to, the, to, the, to Her um, Excellency, the Minister in Estonia, if she could probably elaborate on how this 360 degree feedback that is provided gives light and to how we train teachers as to how the professional development of teachers is taken into consideration, if this yields to training, if this yields to career promotion. So that will be the question, thank you. Thank you, and uh, Honorable Minister from Estonia, would you like to come in and talk about a little bit about the 360 degree feedback uh, process uh, for teachers in Estonia? Okay, I think uh, the Honourable Minister has already left the meeting, but the question is, is on the record. And I think, I think we have also um, run to the end of our time. Um, first of all, I'll, before, before closing the session, I want to really thank the participants here in the room, but also remotely for participating and for uh, contributing also to the discussion. But I also want to reserve a special thanks to all of our speakers on the panel today. I think we heard a rich and very diverse um, inputs in a very short period of time from each of the speakers, which I think has very, been very illuminating. So I'd just like to offer a round of applause from the room uh, to the speakers. Just one or two announcements also. I think we're all aware of the cocktail that's taking place uh, this evening. It's happening at the Serena Hotel at seven o'clock, but there'll be transport uh, leaving from here, um, actually walking, people will be walking. It's very close actually, I've just thought about it. It's just, it's just five minutes walk. <laughs> so people will be meeting, the meeting point will be at the reception here in this hotel uh, at 10 to 7 so that people can kind of walk down together. Don't forget that we have a very exciting uh, program tomorrow, uh, which is the final day of the Pi Policy Dialogue Forum. Uh, and we'll be starting at 9.30 uh, with breakout sessions on teacher preparation. And then again, we have a very high level uh, plenary panel discussing innovations in policy uh, and then in the afternoon, there will be the final breakout session on education policy uh, and uh, innovations from two until 3.30. So I look forward to seeing everybody again tomorrow and uh, also enjoy the cocktail uh, evening uh, tonight. Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs>